Hi and good morning. Welcome to Boom, It's on the Blockchain. Apologies for the late start, Garrett. I had some technical issues with my Dell laptop, deciding to switch down just when I didn't pay for my third McAfee uh, software uh, security service that I seem to pay for there. John McAfee returning from the grave, even though it doesn't belong to him anymore, doesn't get any money from it there as well can still screw yeah. up your computer, you know? Oh, so yeah. how are you anyway, Gannon? I've been doing good. Been doing good here. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting it's talking about McAfee. A new documentary just came out about him. Oh, no, I haven't seen that documentary then as well. I've seen some yeah. of the early documentaries, you know, so it's... Uh, the, the Netflix uh, just came out with a new one, so... Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I wonder if they'll have our political video in it. I bet it's not in it then as well. <laughs> that was that was one of these ones that was cancelled from the internet in the 2020 right. elections. Without yeah. doubt, the best political video made for the 2020 election, I think. But it yeah. uh, didn't make mainstream, you know. Uh, you can find it somewhere on the net, guys, if you have a hunt about Anyway, so today we're going to be talking about the differences between blockchain and Bitcoin. It's our 50th episode. So we've reached the big 5 0 at Boom, it's on the blockchain. So, you know, let me bring in this first article, Garrett, and then you can actually give a bit of rundown because I think it, it comes back to the confusion of what's happening out there. Let's see if we bring that up there. So, what's the difference between blockchain and Bitcoin for people out there to understand, Garrett? Um, well, Bitcoin is the, the first, you know, cryptocurrency out there to use blockchain. It's the first, actually not the first blockchain. The New, New York Times actually has the first blockchain. They, they had that uh, where they hashed all the articles into a giant uh, long term um, thing starting in 1996. If you look it up like New York Times blockchain, that's actually the first blockchain. Um, but with... Um, Bitcoin is a monetary system that's designed for, you know, keeping track of financial transactions. And it was the first system to use it for money. Yeah. And then for people there, like Bitcoin sort of underpinned by the blockchain. So without the blockchain, there would be no Bitcoin. So as we sort of move further into the blockchain space, let's just take that article out there as well. You think of use cases from the blockchain. So where would you see the iteration of the blockchain now? So if Bitcoin came along 2012 or uh, back in 2000 and, 2008, wasn't it, Garrett? So it's um, yeah. 2008. So if you think of the iterations coming along, Satoshi Nakamoto, it's coming now. Now we're at uh, 14 years later. Nearly every company out there it's speaking about the blockchain, being involved in the blockchain, banking's involved in the blockchain, everything's going on to the blockchain, databases are changing because of the blockchain. So, but it's just at the very beginning of this technology. So try and give a bit of insight where you see the blockchain going over the next 10 years and how different sort of financial institutions are going to be using it. Yeah, I think it's going to be very important for, um, you know, the central banks to start using it so that there's a you know a good degree of transparency, you know, for the, these citizens. You know, I think a lot of people would prefer that, you know, if you go right now, it's called FRED. Um, it's like Federal Reserve of St. Louis data. Uh, hold on just one moment. Uh, that, that's Gannett's mother coming in, making sure he's behaving himself then as well. Obviously, didn't tidy his bed this morning, everybody. You know, get better get there. Make your bed, Gannett. As Jordan Peterson de- says, the very first thing everyone wants to do each day is oh, make their bed. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm in an Airbnb. No so it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just telling so you, your mother out there telling you to make your bed, Gannett. No <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, they're just doing some maintenance here. But, um, but yeah, anyways, it's... um. Yeah, with the, with the Bitcoin in the next 10 years, I think it's definitely going to be the central banks are going to have to, um, you know, come in there and do something with the technology next. And I think that's going to be the big the big next step here, um, because the, I think the institutions that there was always this big promise that all oh, the institutions are going to get involved in all this stuff. But um, 
you know, they, they, I don't think will act without a central bank kind of jumping in there and giving the okay. Yeah, I think it's the, I'll bring up the next article that's, um, if we can bring that into the screen again. Oh, I'll bring you back in, Garrett. Sorry. Here we go, guys. So this is like looking at like Bitcoin, Ethereum prices are down this week. Why more Fed rates hikes will mean more price drops. So initially, Bitcoin was seen to be this financial uh, monetary system operating out with the Federal Reserve. Basically, this was our way to move away from the way the government control banking. They can control inflation. They can continue to print money. Bitcoin was seen as this financial institution and financial system that's going to operate out with the control of the federal government. But what we've seen with the last increase in interest rates that it affected Bitcoin. And now with the upcoming interest uh, increase in interest rates again, which the, the Fed's already hinting at, you know, the chances are it's going to happen probably in the next quarter. Explain a bit more how the Federal Reserve now has a control on Bitcoin and Ethereum prices, Garrett. Oh, you've gone quiet. Oh, let's see. Well, these rate hikes, the, you know, they cause issues, you know, sometimes in the you know, we'll have these price drops and whatnot. You'll have um, market events being very correlated to the action that they take. Um, so that's um, something to bear in mind here. And, you know, you see a lot every time they mess with those rates where, um, you know, the prices of these assets gets affected. Yeah. And I think it's like everything else that's out there. You know, that the other article that I'll bring in right now that we'll talk about this is... You know, Bitcoin, uh, Cardano, you know, the th uh, three crypto project investors should watch this crypto winter. But, you know, we're, we're in a crypto winter right now, Garrett. This is it. They're already, this crypto winter now is going to be here, what, for the next 12 months, 18 months they're starting to talk about? I would say about 18 months, you know, it's until in the next halving. So if you could look up Bitcoin halving countdown, you'll you'll see. Yeah, so it's, and I think that is basically in line with potentially this recession. We're already in a recession, even though the Biden administration says we're not in a recession right now. I think because it's like he also says he's 75 and he's not 75 as well. <laughs> but realistically, you know, two quarters of negative growth, it's a recession. It's, you know, we're going at the 8.5, 8.6%. It wasn't 9.1%, but we're still 8.6% inflation, which is high inflation. The cost of goods, the cost of your goods, if you go to the store, the cost of food, that's up 13, 14%. So it's a lot higher. You know, the oil prices come down recently. That's basically because of the recession, people. You know, we're not shipping as many goods in from China. We're not using as much fuel. Therefore, the price of oils come down. That actually helped the inflation numbers in the last month anyway. So as we start to move forward with this, you know, n nothing's operating without the system. And as the Federal Reserve, as the government get involved in regulating cryptocurrencies, you've got your big companies now, uh, you know, listing on the stock markets. So Coinbase, you know, the biggest wallet company, Crypto.com, these companies are now, they're reporting their figures to the market. So they're not operating out with the system. So, you know, if the markets take a hit and these companies are listed on the markets, then Bitcoin's going to take a hit. And then, you know, all the other cryptocurrencies are going to take a hit as well. So we're going into this crypto winter that they speak about, but really the crypto winter is going to fall in line with the tech stocks. It's going to fall in line with what's currently happening out there in the market space. And unfortunately, you know, I don't see this thing repairing itself um, in the next, um, you know, three, six months. This is a long term haul. Now you're seeing in Europe as well, inflation's high out there. So that's another problem that's happening. So suddenly you've got this technology, but the technology is advancing, as Garrett said. The technology is now moving forward. Now we're using the blockchain for so many different applications. And really, it's just at its absolute infancy. And it's like the birth of the internet. It's the next iteration of the internet, the, extra, the next iteration of finance on the internet. 
That's what some people try to explain it to say there as well. But it's more than that. So we database systems speak to each other. You know, it's gone from individual database systems to, you know, central database systems where we're sharing data like we've never shared before. So all this technology is coming in and it's, it's not that difficult to get a handle on it when you start reading about it. It's just that we want to understand what's under the hood. And someone like Garrett does understand what's under the hood. But, you know, do you understand what's under the hood in your car? You know, how does a carburetor work? I don't get into my car and I don't panic. Does the carburetor work on my Honda 2007 Honda CRV? Does the air conditioning work? Garrett knows it doesn't. <laughs> 98 degrees today in San Diego. Yeah, I could tell, I can say from experience the AC doesn't work. 308,000 miles, but the carburetor works great. So, but do, do I know how the carburetor works? No. Do I panic about the carburetor working? No. I just turn there, turn the key and drive. And I want to get from A to B. So this technology, and it's like that human way of wanting, you need to understand everything. You know, do people actually understand how the internet works? You don't. You just think, oh, I've got 4G instead of like 5G means it's slow. I can't download a movie because it's slow. My internet's gone offline with Cox. What am I going to do? I can't work, you know? What will I do? What will I do? My internet's gone offline. But you don't actually understand how the internet works, how it basically breaks down data, travels along a line, and essentially back then it was the old copper lines until everything became fiber. So the way they carried information was a lot slower. And then again, it creates the pixels at the other end and the data information. And that's basically in a nutshell. Maybe you could go a bit more technical on how the internet actually works for people out there to understand, get it, you know? Yeah, it's, um, you know, at a very basic level, you have a protocol, you know, the TCP IP protocol at a very basic level. And, um, you know, that, that, basically controls these packets of information moving, you know, um, through the internet, you know, from computer to computer, um, using, you know, protocols like, you know, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, um, you know, the stuff that you're all used to by now. Um, but yeah, at a very basic level, the internet's a TCP IP protocol at a very basic level. And there's also encryption too, you know, you have the, um, you know, the SHA-256 encryption standard, uh, which was used in Bitcoin as well. But the Bitcoin, the protocol level is, um, you know, the you know, SHA-256 hash for the blocks. Um, it's a little bit different. Yeah. The internet for money, essentially. Yeah. So it's, so be, exactly. So for most people there, got it just speaking gobbledygook, you know? So it's, uh, they don't understand it, but they, they use it every day. And you're using this technology every day. And now you're happy for your bank. Before, when you put money in the bank, like people here, traditionally in America, you know, they would hide their cash. There's still people here hide their cash in their wall, under a mattress, in a safe at home. They feel more comfortable having dollars in the safe at home. If you go out to places, there's more $100 bills up flying about the Middle East than there is in America right now believe that because I out there, their banking systems you know aren't safe to keep their money and the safest place they can keep their money is not on their local currency and them having hundred dollar bills and they're having safer having hundred dollar bills rolled up in a little sock tucked away in the you know the cupboard or someplace like that because that's a safer place to keep your money but Absolutely. now all of our money is basically just some numbers on a computer screen you go on the computer oh, oh look you know the numbers are there Oh, look, who's taking numbers out of my computer? My Netflix, my, um, uh, my Hulu, my Google. You know, Google takes plenty of money out of you. Apple takes money out of you. Oh, yeah, take, a, take some photos, guys. Keep taking photos. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, wait a minute. You've got to pay Apple $9.99 a month to keep your photos for you, you know, forever. <laughs> it's like, eh, you used to keep your photos in a drawer. So you're paying this money to do it. You don't even realize everything's digitizing so fast. So if you're starting to think of this technology coming in, in three years, five years from this technology, we'll just be using it. Everything will be in the blockchain. We'll be using central database systems. We're not going to be worrying about the CO2 emissions of mining, stuff like that. It's all changing anyway. It's just this yeah. fear factor coming in, essentially pushed narrative from the government. But as the governments control the system more, they like it more. Oh, yeah, well, we're, we're not, we're, you know, before, you, if you go back three years, five years, you have people like Goldman Sachs talking about, you know, 
that Bitcoin's not here to say. You know, that Bitcoin's going to go to zero. It's going to be a waste of time. That blockchain's not going to work. We're never going to move to those systems. Now they've got departments doing that. Now they're creating their own tokens. Now they're creating their own stable coins. There's the Federal Reserve. Yeah, they're going to come out with their own digital dollar at some point. It's their digital dollar. They'll love it. You know, it's not backed against anything. It's the Fed's digital dollar. We all use the digital dollar now. And then, you know, and that'll, that'll just come out the next drop. There's already a white paper went out about it. The first white paper was actually released earlier this year, but the Federal Reserve's digital dollar. So they've yeah. actually written a digital dollar white paper. They're not obviously sending it to everyone at home, you know, and, and then they'll tie this into universal basic income. So there'll be some sort of model tied into UBI. And the, the fear when you go, there's people speaking Joe Rogan and other shows about this thing, that if they provide you universal basic income, you'll only be allowed to use it for certain goods and services. A bit like food stamps right now. You can't go, oh, here's my food stamps. I'm going to exactly. buy 10 That's bottles of vodka. They're planning yeah. for it, exactly. So the digital dollar, the Fed's digital dollar, if people research it a little bit, is you'll be only allowed to use this for certain purchases. Now, you know, everyone says, well, Big Brother's watching. They'll know what you're buying it. They know what you're buying it for anyway. You know what I mean? People need to realize if you put it into this device, if you use this thing called the finger and you press it on a keyboard and you press it on your phone, you're guaranteed that that is tracked. If you actually, it's getting, what's weird is creepy about Facebook is essentially you agree to all their terms and conditions. You know, we can be speaking about something on this podcast right now. And then we'll go on to Facebook and suddenly it's got an advert for it. It's like, I've not even searched for it. It's like they're using voice recognition and then taking the algorithm for that and then suddenly pushing adverts for your way to buy these things. And it's, you agree to everything anyway. So people think I'm not getting tracked. If you don't want to get tracked, throw your phone in the bucket. You know, If you don't want to get tracked, move everything cash. But you're, but you're only going to get so far with that because that's what they want. If you've got a driver's license, you're tracked. You've got a little barcode in the back of your driver's license now. People don't even realize that. When you go into a place, it's like that. If you go to the airport, they look at it. They don't scan the picture and look at who's that you. They, all they do is take the barcode at the back, boom, and the same yeah. way they do it with a passport. So yeah. you don't track people, you know? So you've got to think about that. So I know and I know a lot of people get upset about that, you know? It's just like, well, Big Brother's looking into us, this as well. Well, if you want to go off grids and hide in the woods, you know, that's up to you. But if you want to stay and use all the technology, you know, you've got to agree to the system. And then if you don't read 4,000 pages of uh, agreeing to the terms and conditions of the new policy in Facebook, you just have to click yes. I actually, you believe it or not, because I did that political video with McAfee and was involved with Co Cash Libertarian Party, when I came to actually use my um, Facebook account, I had to go and get my uh, ID notarized and I had to send a notarized document to Facebook to say this guy is who he is now. So this is like next level. It was also because I was wanting to do some advertising on them. They said, oh, we don't want Russian collusion or some garbage. You know what I mean? So it's like, but you just think, well, why am I having to notarize my own license, driver's license, and send to Facebook in order to actually do Facebook advertising? And then I'm paying Facebook for fake followers anyway. You know, what's with that part of the deal? You know, it's like there's not 2 billion people on Facebook today. It's all, you know, it's probably 80 people and 1.8 billion metaverse fake people from like Zuckerberg and that. But and I'll tell you the weird thing about Zuckerberg is like, if you watch him now, he is actually morphing into a metaverse character. You know, I think that he's just like, he's yeah. more and more like he actually is digital. He's just like his face. And he's all got like super buff, like the guy from Amazon, you know, little dweeby yeah. guy, didn't look there as well. Sort of baldy head, little side bits. Next thing you know, the guy's like looks like he's out of the Avengers now. <laughs> Massive, you know. Is that real or is that digital technology? What's your thoughts on that, Garrett? Um, I don't know. When you that rich, you could probably hire somebody to be your personal trainer. <laughs> it's probably good for your health. <laughs> well, good, but I don't know. Good, it's good, 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 good. Good. so weird. You know, they they have like you know weird control freak stuff that they do. So I wouldn't doubt it if they maybe put something out out there that is a deep fake of them, you know, gets their rocks off. They feel good about it, that they tricked everybody. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, 
That's all out there. You just got to see. Well, that's the, that's what's happening anyway. So you no point getting too upset about it, you know. So <laughs> it's um, yeah. so we'll just we're there. But you know, we've been whizzing along with Bitcoin, blockchain. The technology is here to stay. There's no, there's nothing more truer about this. It's and it's going to go. It's going to be involved in everything going forward. And it's going the way database systems work together. The way of sharing data and information is changing now. It's already changing because people think about your phone. You know, originally when you were getting iPhones, you want to get more and more memory, bigger and bigger phone, because you hold more photos. So the time you got the next iPhone, you didn't have that ability to put all your photos on the cloud. So you had to do that way where you transferred all the photos onto your phone. And that transfer, when you switched phones, you may be too young for this, but I remember the original iPhones coming out, iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, coming in there. When you did the upgrade, Garrett, you had to get the bigger uh, space in terms of memory. So you were starting yeah. off with 128, then you were 256, and you had to get 512, and you had to keep getting bigger because otherwise you were going to get the phone and you couldn't transfer all your own photos. And then what you do, is you, before you switched it, you went through your phone and deleted loads just to even take all the photos across. But now it's just like you just update it onto the cloud, just like, and you just click it, updates onto the cloud, gets the new iPhone, opens in, puts your ID, boom, everything comes back in again. We're back in the old days, you would go back to square one. All your apps were gone, everything was there as well. And that cloud service is essentially central database systems that we are just utilizing in a, you know, a far greater way with the blockchain. Would you not say that, yeah. uh, but how would be anything to add on that, Garrett? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's interesting to view things like that. And, you know, we've uh, certainly come a long way from the central databases and being dependent on those. Yeah, so let me have a look there. All electric cars in California by 2035. What is the, the new rule? Here it is. This NPR came out. This was out last week. Let's bring it in. We'll just move to uh, chewing the cud, actually, as we're whizzing along quite well here. Let's see. Chewing the cud today. We're going to speak about electric vehicles. So let me bring this article back in then, get it. So last week, California wants to end the sale of all new gas cars by 2035. And that's been put into law. And I think there's a yep. couple other states followed this. So yep. after that point, and they're already giving you sort of incentives in order to acquire electric cars, you know, you're, you're looking 55,000 for, and that's not even top of the line, you know, your sort of Model Y uh, Teslas. If you start going into the top of the range Teslas, you know, 120, 150,000, and then add all the add-ons, it's going to be up for there. And then the new truck will be coming out next year. So, you know, that, that price is going to increase there as well. So not everyone yeah. can spend 55000 on uh, Model Y. Is it Model Y? Yeah. And the Tesla. So, but, you know, everyone's now getting driven to the point that they're, uh, the car companies, the car companies are going to like this anyway, because it just forces everyone to change their vehicle. You know, it's not, it's not like they're going to be 100% against this type thing. But ultimately, we're moving into this one week later, Let's bring the next article in. California told not to charge electric cars during the day um, because uh, after the gas sale ban. And then if you actually go into it, because to avoid, so Californians may need to take measures to conserve energy, including avoiding charging electric vehicles to prevent strain to the state's power grid over the Labor Day weekend. So it's Labor Day weekend, you're not allowed to charge your electric vehicle. <laughs> and it's like, unbelievable, really. You start to think about it. It's just like, but it comes back to the same. We speak about this all the time. It's like people think, well, I've got to do my bit to save the environment. You know, we're going to have to increase fossil fuel to power the grid in order for everyone to charge their electric vehicles. People are aware of that information. And we're obviously increasing fossil fuel production for all the goods and services we bring in from China and India. So no matter what you think, everything coming in from China, we spoke about before, like all golf equipment, all golf balls, all golf clubs, they're all made from coal. All Apple products are made from coal power to generate the product itself. If you go to Foxconn, that's who it is. They subcontract at people 
Now, Apple want to be green. Yes, we've got a call center that's powered by a wind farm and a solar farm. Uh, pat in the back for us. Oh, by the way, every single product we make is made from coal. They don't sell you that bit. Nike, every single, you know, Nike, we are basically social warriors. We are coming out social justice warriors. We are doing our bit for the world. Everything we manufacture is made from coal. Now, China's opening more and more coal plants. We want cheaper and cheaper product. We want to keep buying cheaper product from China. We still want everything made from coal. That in itself is just so weird. And like people don't get upset about that. You don't get upset that your Amazon product's made from coal. You don't get angry about that. You get angry because Arizona isn't going to make their uh, state legislator, legislator change the law at this point, so we all have to switch to electric vehicles for 2035. Look at those guys. People in Arizona want to end the world. It's like it's like total nonsense. It's like people need to realize it's the 200 new coal plants we've opened in Asia in the last year, massive industrial coal plants to create huge amounts of power, to generate huge amounts of electricity, to make the product. And then we stick them on these massive tankers and then what we do is we use huge diesel generators, these things the size of like eight football fields, and they ship them slowly around the world from China to America, pumping massive amounts of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere to come here, to go into your Amazon truck, to be delivered to your door, and you go, yes, I've got my product, and my T-shirt says, save the environment. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, um... where's the Green Brigade about that? They don't say anything. It's just because yeah. it's like either they don't know or they choose not to tell the people that follow them that basic information. Whereby what America could actually do is we could increase domestic oil and gas production. So we're not held by over a barrel by people like Putin. You get all the red, you get all the right wingers and all that coming out and just saying nothing to do with Putin in that. It's like he just switched off Nord Stream 1 for maintenance. We spoke about this before. It's like most people don't understand oil and gas, you know. He could, the minute he turns off the tap for a few days, a few days later, gas prices are going up. It's as simple as that. He's just got a button now. Boom, 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 boom. It affects everybody. People need to understand that, you know. And it's just like there's Biden cap in hand out to Saudi Arabia begging them to sell more oil. Saudis are now saying because of the upcoming recession, they're going to actually start to reduce oil production. Because they don't want the price going way down below what it is right now. And it'll continue to go down. So there's America. Now we want to be green. We've, we've sold off all the unions. You know, we sold off all the manufacturing in the 70s and 80s. We moved it all out there. The corporations won. Why can't we move all the manufacturing back? Why can't we bring all the manufacturing back and use solar panels and wind uh, turbines? But wind turbines don't work as well. But solar panels for them to bring that back in for mass manufacturing. They're already doing it in certain areas. They could do that. But why don't they want to do that? You think, why do they not want to do that? That would actually help save the environment. America could go green like that. And then if we're using automation, so we're using artificial intelligence, we're using automation, we're using renewable energy, we're creating all the plants back here. Yeah, you're not going to have 5,000 jobs. You're going to have 50 people now and 5,000 robots. But I'll tell you what, I'll create inward investment. We've got the infrastructure in place. We've got places in Detroit where we ripped everything out. We can go straight back in. Minnesota, we ripped everything out. We can go straight back in. You can actually go back into these places that you destroyed in the 80s and put the manufacturing back and use renewable energy. And we can do that. So why does the government not push that narrative? Why does the government on the left and the right choose not to push it? You know, you just think, well, what is, what's it about? There's something fundamentally wrong with what they're doing right now. And they're yeah. lying to the people about why we don't do that. And all they want to do is find scapegoats. It's the guys that produce small amounts of oil living in Texas. It's their fault. It's the people in, the, in Kentucky. It's all their fault. It's Kentucky's fault. It's like you're getting people here to basically fixate in other parts and saying they're happy for the end of the world. The world's not going to end. The world is not going to end. You know, us living on this planet might end at some point, Garrett. You know, I get that. But it's not going to be for billions of years unless there's some sort of nuclear war that wipes a lot of us out. But realistically, people, you know, if you went back and you started looking at it, we've been on this planet now, what, five to seven million years, Garrett? Homo sapiens. 
you know, it's only recently we've started we've started to like, you know, morph into this. We're actually all so similar. This is the weird thing. We're all so similar, Garrett. We're basically, yep. yes, we've got pigmentation colors and skin, we've got different hair colors, but really, if you look at us compared to like different other animals, you know, there's more difference between the Indian elephant and the African elephant than there is between the different people within the human race across the world. That's how you much you can put it in perspective, you know? Because their ears yeah. are so much bigger than other than otherwise. We don't change that much. So people just there, we fixate and stuff. You're controlled and things. You know, if you think you're sitting at home, you're living in your Facebook or Instagram echo chamber, you're understanding that. You've got to just start to look out with that as well. And people read, they realize that this technology of the blockchain that's coming in, this decentralized system, is a time for wealth to be distributed in a way that has never been done before. And are we going to be allowed to do this or not? But more and more people are waking up for it. And if they want to push more totalitarian government control over people, it's going to not let them access this wealth, which is sad. There's the education thing coming in. The big education thing that happened last week, Garrett. Everyone's going to get a 10,000 rebate. And then you've got Fox News furious at this. It's like, why are they so furious? 10, 000, the question you've got to be asking yourself is, why do the universities need to be making billions of dollars? You know, other countries and universities, some of these universities are sticking on, they're sticking billions of dollars in cash in their bank. Some of them have more money in cash and bank than Walmart. It's like, eh, how can Harvard have more money in the bank than Walmart? You know, cash in hand. That doesn't make sense. So wait a minute, that's because they're charging so much money to people. So maybe their price model could come. And it can't just be a case of, we'll write a $10,000 check but what, what happens going forward? It doesn't help anybody go forward. The problem still can, can, can used to go forward like that. Why do young kids have to get so much in debt? Why does the government not just say, oh, we, we can pay for an online university for everyone for, for free going forward? So we can keep up with developing countries like China, where they invest in their education. Germany invest in their education. These systems are in place. It's like America's just like losing out and all you want to do is blame the other guy. Well, I had to pay my $10,000 off. Well, you know, at some point, you're going to have to not look in the past and just say, you can't keep blaming the past for what it is. You've got to draw a line in the sand and say, right, from now on, we're going to change the way we're working. Now, if people still want to go to Harvard and spend 200 grand to get an education and they can afford it or they want to take the debt, good for them. But anyone mm -hmm. else from an inner city area and wants to work, you know, they shouldn't be forced to your way out of inner city areas to become an NBA basketball player <laughs> or to become a football player. Because yeah. that's the technology, but because like how many NBA players are there? There's a few. What, a couple of hundred, two, three hundred make it and to be multimillionaires of 10 million, 12 million people. It's not it's not it's, it's not good numbers. It's not good statistics. It shouldn't be like that. It's inner city areas like that in the UK as well. People are saying, you've got to become a soccer player. You're coming from the poorest parts of society. Why does that person have to be a soccer player? Why can't that person become a lawyer or, or a doctor? Why don't we create systems like that? Because I'll tell you what, there's thousands of doctors. There's a shortage of doctors. Why can't we push them into that? It doesn't make any sense to me, Garrett, you know? What's your thoughts on all that, Garrett? A bit of a rant, really. But... Yeah, it's... um. You know, I think there's different opportunities out there everywhere in the world, you know, for all sorts of different people. And, um, you know, it, one of the things I look at is, you know, being um, being an artist, being a painter. You know, I do a lot of painting and whatnot. But in the U.S., it's like, um, you know, they'll teach these these art classes in school, but you could never um, you could never imagine as a as an adult. I mean, some people get. I'm not going to say conned, but they end up going to art school and they end up in a boatload of debt and uh, they're not really going to be able to pay that off with art. <laughs> um, but if it was, I think if society maybe was a little bit more genuine about like, okay, you, you don't need school to learn how to do art. You know, you don't need that. Um, there's certain techniques and there's people out there, you know, different people you could learn from, but, um, yeah, but it's, it's or they could, they could be letting them go to art school, but not saddling them the hundred grand's worth of debt. Yeah. Charging what it's worth. 
but you know, some but of them. It's they're eighteen great. to twenty-two. It's like they're great yeah. programs, but some of them are great programs. I, you know, I'm not going to knock art school, but um, I, I, I had Greenville art school students. They were my friends, you know, not the business studies students. You know, the minute I got into rave organizing, it was just like. <laughs> Yeah. Organized a few raves back in the day when we were in art school and that, and all beach party and forest party and stuff. Oh, yeah. and the art students were our mainstay of supporters. But again, it's you, you're right, Gary. It's just like, why are it's this saddling of young people with huge amounts of debt by the time they're 22 years old? Yeah. When they should be allowed to follow their passion, they should be allowed to push their passion. Now, they're still cost it. The, the, the problem with the whole thing is, why do the universities need to make billions of dollars? Number one. Why do the university professors need to be multimillionaires? You want to be a multimillionaire, go run your own business. I get it. You want to write a book, people buy your book. Can you make a lot of money from that? Great. But you, you should be getting paid like 300 grand a year to be t as a teacher, essentially there. So the sa at the same yeah. time, the kids are costing 50 grand to go and to pay your 300 grand salary. And then they get yeah. to tenure. Tenure here, it's like te tenure. What does that? That means a job for life, you know. Yeah, it's like basically being a Supreme Court judge. It's just a case of at what point, like every other job in the world, you don't do a good job, you get sacked. That's how it works. You don't do a good job, yeah. you're fired. You know, <laughs> Supreme Court judge, you can't be fired. You're in. You're in forever. It doesn't matter how old you get. That's why they're all so old. What are they going to do? Retire? They should put a time limit on it. You know. It's like politicians. They should put a time limit on what they, what they do. You know, how can Biden be a politician 50 years? That's totally ridiculous. But look how long Pelosi's been in there. Is it not time you retired? We should make you do the 100 meters. And if you can't do the 100 meters in under 35 seconds, bear in mind Bolt did it in nine and a half seconds. Well, we'll say 40 seconds. If you can't do the 100 meters under 40 seconds, yet we can't let you be a politician anymore. <laughs> if we could push out to a minute in that, they probably wouldn't do it in that. I think Trump would probably do it in about 55 seconds. You know what I mean? He might make it a minute. But you've got to basically have a sort of time limit to these people keep going on or some other way of doing it. You could just say, well, you can only be a, a politician for, you know, 12 years. And during that 12 years, we want to work out how at the end of it, you're worth 60 million on a $180,000 salary. You know, nobody gets taught that economics in business school. It's like the best job in the world, you know? So people push that. So that's just basically politicians. And, you know, they're all feathering their own nests. Let's be realistic. It doesn't matter which side. Whether they're left, whether they're right, the one thing guaranteed is they like feathering their own nest, you know? So yeah. I mean, who they're taking money from, the lobbyists. They should be made, They should every time they speak, they should have, like, across the screen, captions of all the people they've taken money from, you know? NRA, yep. and we've taken a lot of money from them. Exxon Mobile, we've taken a lot of money from them. <laughs> you know, yep. It's just like, it keeps going, it keeps going. It's just like, wait a minute, pharmaceutical companies, they're racing along all the logos and that as well. He's, so if they're getting money from all these people, talking millions of dollars to help them get into office, when it comes to vote, that's what they do. I was actually spoke to a lobbyist at an oil and gas show. And he said there was basically three levels and they all live together apparently in Washington. So the politicians like living together in their gated community alongside the lobbyists. You know, they all go golfing together. They all play together. They all have coffees together. They all have dinner together. You know, McConnell and Schumer, you know, these guys are best buddies people. You know, Google McConnell and Schumer. You see them out for dinner together laughing. That guy McConnell, I've never seen that guy laugh once, ever. You, you, you Google McConnell and Schumer, they're laughing together all the time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, nice to see you. What are you getting for Christmas and that, you know? And you look at yeah. that. Anyway, the three levels, this is just the last thing because I know Gareth has to go. So one, you, you, the first level is like level C, lobbyist level. This is where you take some money from them and you just need to vote their way when it comes in, okay? So number yeah. level B, that comes in. It's a little bit more money and you can be a little bit like someone does a tweet about this you share or like the tweet, showing your one. And then the third one, you become a spokesperson for them. And they'll take, say, so it's like 100 grand, 500 grand, million dollars. And there's your three levels of doing this. Now, if you do this with 20 companies and you've got your 100 grand, your 500 grand, your million dollars, you know, that's 20 million you're bringing in. 
Now, yeah. you think if you've taken 20 million from different corporations that these guys don't have some influence over you? Because when the next election comes around, who do you go back to to ask for more money? It all works the same. And then you employ your family members and stuff like that. Ilian Omar, you know, she was a prime example. As someone from the Democrat side, supposed to be representing the people. She was getting paid 180 grand doing that. She employs her husband as a consultant to lead her basically campaign team. Two million dollars she pays him. So her household now is getting 2.2 million dollars. And I this was in the news, and she didn't even break the rules. That's not even and she and the thing is, she's probably the least corrupt out of them all. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would say, like, 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 let's see what McConnell and Schumer are up to. They're going to be like a million times worse than her. So don't just go banging on about Elaine Omar, you know. That's how it sort of works in that, uh, Garrett, you know. So anyway, that's chewing the cud, Garrett. Anyway, the Bitcoin, the blockchain, it's here to stay, people. If you don't want to be tracked, don't use this little device that uh, God gave you a long time ago. And the primates had it and stuff. It's called the finger. Press the button. It's tracked. <laughs> Zuckerberg knows what you're up to. The rest of them know what up to. Speaking to this device called the telephone that was developed by Scotland, Logie Baird, you know, that's tracked as well. People, that information's held, sold off to some marketing company, and then they'll start phoning you, trying to sell you stuff. You know, don't carry your phone around with you, your Apple Watch. It tracks you everywhere you go. Hide in the woods, sell all your stuff, live under a rock. And that's maybe your only chance. Don't spend any money with a credit card. They're tracking that to you. Cash only. <laughs> Cash only. Basically, don't use a driver's license that's got a barcode on it. So after I've given you all these insights, maybe maybe you'll be able to keep things uh, on a safety there as well. Anything to add to that today, Garrett? I think you're on mute somehow, actually. Oh, yeah, I, I uh, put myself on mute. Um, but yeah, it's a great when you don't even have to say it. I don't have to, I don't even have to say it. You, you said everything I was thinking. So yeah. but now it's um, thinking the next one will be the thought I process. I had like two or three people call me and during this. So I got to jump and take these calls. But yeah, another great one. Yeah, Boom appreciate it. And back. next week, we've actually got um, uh, the leading lady in space uh, blockchain. She's coming on the show wow. as well. So that's cool. So right. that'll be a big one for us as well. But that's, you've been watching Boom, It's on the Blockchain. Thanks again, Gannett. Thanks to everyone who's watched. My name's Alistair Caithness, 50, and keep going.